Hi everyone, it's Lisa. We're going to do the October 2018 uh, written language portion. So starting with number one, how a cat in the hat changed children's education. Now we are not going to be reading through these paragraphs in their entirety. We're just going to be looking at the questions and I'm also going to show you how to identify patterns in the answer choices. So let's start with number one. Uh, I'm just going to go up a little bit um, above where the number one is and we're going to start where the sentence starts. Among other problems, Hershey noted the reading materials available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media. So this is a parallel structure question, and because we have with television and then just comma radio, um, other media does not need any further introduction other than the and, so it can stay. There was not a with before uh, radio, so there does not need to be a with before and. Uh, and also is redundant, so you can get rid of that. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why. Um, this is the correct answer. Uh, it doesn't need a width because there's not a width here before radio and also would be redundant and then and competing with would also be redundant because competing is right here. Okay, so that is our first question. Easy peasy. Moving on to number two. Number two says the writer wants to include a question by her, a quotation by Hershey um, that supports the topic of the passage. So because this is a whole passage question, we might end up having to come back to it. On test day, make sure you give yourself a really big circle to remember to come back to things like this. Um, but going back up, we can read a little bit more. Um, so the material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other materials for children's attention. One solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting. Um, and then all of them start with this idea of interesting and then why they might be interesting. So we need to know more about what the, par the passage is talking about. Um, so let's move on to number three. The story of the Cat in the Hat's publication began when William Spaulding, the director of the education division at the publishing company uh, Houghton Mifflin, read Hersey's article and had an idea. Okay, so the director of education division at the publishing company Houghton Milton, M Mifflin is in a positive phrase describing uh, William. So if you see right here, William Spaulding, and then we have a comma that sets this off, and then we find out that he is the director of these things, and he read Hersey's article. Um, so the sentence itself would be, William Spaulding read Hersey's article. Everything else is in a positive phrase, so it can be removed. We want to make sure our positive phrases balance, and right now the commas do, so that's looking like a good response. Um, this one does not set off the director from Spalding at all, and so that parenthetical phrase is lost. This one puts the comma after the director, which ruins the parenthetical phrase's meaning. And then this one provides a dash, which is not backed up at the end. So because A is the one that offers the matching um, commas, that is the one we are looking for. Remember that those commas could have been dashes if they both match, but because, um, because answer choice D offers one dash and one comma, it does not work. Okay, number four. Um, we're combining sentences. So right now it says, um, it continues on Hersey's article and had an idea. Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. He thought he knew who should write one. So combining it is usually going to also kind of truncate the sentence. Um, so by adding this and he, that does combine it effectively. We don't lose anything. Uh, namely, he knew who would read it. That doesn't really work because it's not specifically that he knew. It's just in addition, he, he knew who he thought should write it. Um, adding his name again would uh, just be a redundancy. The pronoun is fine, so we can get rid of C. Uh, and then this word meanwhile here, we don't need a transition at all. So to combine it, we're just going to turn that period into a comma and conjunction. All right. Number five. Uh, which choice supports the information that follows in the sentence? So a trick on this is don't read what's offered to you because that is only one answer choice. Um, we want to see what offers, what, uh, what follows. All right, so uh, Giesel was an experienced writer and illustrator. So to set that up, we could say, answer choice A, having known Spalding for many years and having maintained a professional relationship with him, that has nothing to do with him being a, an experienced writer and illustrator, so we can get rid of A. Um, having acquired a reputation for per perfectionism and setting high standards, again, that doesn't make him a an experienced writer and illustrator. Been interested in politics before breaking into the genre? No. Having published nine children's books and having received three nominations for a prestigious Caldecott Award? That would 
prove him to be an experienced writer and illustrator. So that is the correct answer. Now we have a transition um, question. So we're not going to read the transition word offered because, again, that's one answer choice. But we're going from learning about uh, Theodore Geisel being an experienced uh, writer and illustrator and him publishing nine books um, to this idea that this new project presented him with an obstacle. Okay, so that is different. However, might work. Um, the difficulty is not an example of him being an experienced writer and illustrator. It is not a further detail. Um, and it is not at any rate. That is kind of a really awkward way to say um, Say, however, it doesn't work. So we're just going to stick with A, however. Okay, number seven. Um, so it looks like um, these are all different ways of saying the same thing. And so we need to make sure that the, sub, that the uh, modifier is in the correct place. Um, Giesel started two stories only to abandon them when he found that he needed to use words that were not on the list. On the verge of giving up, Giesel's story finally hit upon an image. Okay, so Giesel's story was not on the verge of giving up. Giesel was. So we can um, get rid of A. So on the verge of giving up, an image that Giesel finally hit upon? No, because again, the, the image is not giving up. Giesel finally hit upon the image. Yes, because Giesel was the one that was about to give up. Um, let's check D just to be sure. Um, on the verge of giving up, the story was finally based. So we can choose C based on this idea of a misplaced modifier. We need to know who is about to give up, and then that noun needs to follow here. So C works because Giesel himself was the one about to give up. All right, number eight. Um, this one is, again, different ways of saying the same thing. After 36 weeks or nine months, um, you can start looking for patterns and answers. So A is at the end of a duration of nine months, so that's a little long. Um, and then B says after 36 weeks or nine months, that's a little redundant. After a length of nine months had elapsed, so after an elapsed is a little redundant. So D, nine months later, is the most concise way of saying that. All right, number nine, and we're almost through with this first passage. Um, so we have was, has been, completely deleting it, and then is. So this is probably going to be a subject verb agreement as well as a tense question. So we need to figure out what is um, what the subject is. So the book was a hit. Children were entertained by its plot about the antics of mischievous cat and is captivated by its eye-catching illustrations. So who is captivated by the eye-catching illustrations? It's um, the children. So children are plural, so we can get rid of is, and we can get rid of... Um, we can get rid of was because that's also singular and we can get rid of has been because that's also sin singular. So children were entertained by its plot about the antics of the mischievous cat and entertained by its eye catching illustrations. So we can just delete it and that definitely does work. Um, this delete option, guys, is uh, the correct answer 50% of the time. So don't be afraid of it. It will work. Um, number 10. We have all these different sets of punctuation but no words are changing. Notice this is followed period many and this is followed semicolon many and so both of those are wrong. We don't have to read the sentence to know that both of those are wrong. Now D is offering us a dash. Anytime you see a dash, what comes before it has to be complete. So let's take a look. Um, it starts. In the years that followed, so that sounds like an introductory sentence, it's not complete so it can't be D comma, many talented writers and illustrators for children's books imitated Giesel's formula. All right, so that is an incomplete to a complete, so we need that comma. Number 11, the writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. Um, but perhaps the best proof of the Cat in the Hat success is not the, its influence on other books, but its limited vocabulary and appealing word choices. No, that was just one minor point that he had to write it in under 140 with less than 140 different words. Um, so it's impressive worldwide sales. No, it wasn't about making money. It was about engaging children. Enduring ability to delight children and engage them in learning how to read. That is a fair choice. Or important role in the history of illustrations in the 20th century. No, um, although his art is beloved by many, it was not just about the art. Okay, so if you remember, we have one question that we need to go back to because it asked about the whole passage. 
Um, the writer wants to include a quotation by Hersey that supports the topic of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? All right, so um, we know that Hersey noted the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. One solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting since, okay, an in individual sense of wholeness follows and cannot precede a sense of accomplishment. No, because it's about engaging children with interesting books. Interesting since learning starts with failure. The first failure is the beginning of education. No, that is not what this article is about, and it's a little redundant. Because journalism allows its readers to witness history. No, this is children's books. Interesting with drawings like those of the wonderfully imaginative imaginative geniuses among children's illustrators. Yes, because then we meet, uh, we learn about the cat in the hat and Theodore Geisel. So that one is D. Okay, so that's it for the first passage on our written language test. We can move on to passage two. Um, so keep student volunteering voluntary. Um, a growing number of public schools in the United States require students to complete community service hours to graduate. Such volunteering, be it helpful helping at local animal shelters, um, when they pick up litter or working at a health care facility. Okay, so if you notice, we have helping a gerund and where we're doing it, and then we have working a gerund and where we're doing it. So this underlined portion also needs to be a gerund and what we're doing. So the only one that offers us that gerund is this ing, D. All right, number 13, the writer wants to transition from the previous paragraph that highlights the criticism of compulsory volunteering mentioned in the previous paragraph. What choice accomplishes this goal? So let's go ahead and finish out this paragraph. Um, so whether helping at local animal shelters, picking up litter, or working at a healthcare facility um, has obvious benefits for the community. It serves and teaches students important life skills. But critics say that making students volunteer or making volunteerism compulsory or mandatory misses the point of the act. Um, volunteer work done is done willingly. So to introduce and connect back, we could say by its very definition, volunteer work is done necessary, which actually seems nice, so let's hold on to that one. Whatever the work may be, volunteer work is uh, supposed to be done willing. I think we're supposed to be responding to this compulsory idea, so I don't think B does that. For many students, it is done willingly, and this is actually wanting to say that all of it is, so let's get rid of that one. Um, fortunately for communities in need, volunteer work is done willingly. Willingly, No. So the whole point is connecting to this idea that volunteerism is supposed to be willing and up here they're making it compulsory. So that is the connection. All right, number 14. Um, we have officials, plural possessive, and then we have students, plural possessive, and then we have officials, plural, and then we have students in a variety of ways. So let's see what's going on. Um, volunteer work is done willingly by requiring students to do community service in order to graduate school officials. Okay, so we know it's not that because that just needs to be plural. Are taking away students' choice to give up. Okay, so the students does need to be possessive because the students own the choice. So now we need to ask ourselves, is it plural possessive or singular possessive? Is it one student or multiple students? The way this is written, it looks like it is taking away students, plural, and so we need the apostrophe to go after the S. If it was singular, this one, it would have to say a student's choice. All right, so that is our plural versus possessives. Um, okay, on number 15, let's take a look at this. A says volunteer, volunteering who are in favor of it. Um, B is volunteering, advocating it. And then C is just volunteering, and D is volunteering and its advocates. So if you look at this, there's a pattern in favor, advocating, and advocates are all very similar. C is the only one that's different. So without reading the sentence, I am already very certain that it is C. So let's take a look and double check. Proponents of compulsory volunteering who are in favor of it, that's redundant, um, because they are already proponents. That means they're in favor of it and that they're advocating it. So proponents of compulsory volunteering point out um, that it allows young people to garner the benefits of volunteer that volunteering offers. So this one is just C. Start looking for patterns in the answer choices, and you might be able to you might you might be able to start noticing these things. Which choice provides a supporting example that is most similar to the example already in the sentence? 
Okay, so the example already in the sentence says, students who volunteer report increased self-esteem, better relationship building skills, and okay, so this is increased, better, and increasingly busy schedules. That does not feel like a positive to me, so let's get, oh, wait, wrong one. Uh, let's get rid of it. And a closer connection with community. Okay, that is a positive. Less time spent engaging in social activities. That would be a negative to most teenagers, so we can get rid of that. Little increase in academic achievement. That's not necessarily a negative, but it's also not a positive. So we're needing this closer connection with community. Um, better relationship building skills, increased self-esteem, and then a closer connection with community are all positive ideas. Okay, here we have affect versus effect, and then we have um, some uh, plural versus singular and uh, some gerund. So let's look. Some studies have also found that students who do community service are more likely to volunteer as adults and thus affect society positively. Okay, so remember that effect is the noun and affect is the verb. So we can get rid of all the effects because we need a verb here. So now we have to decide between um, the plural versus singular form of the verb. So um, students who are, are more likely to volunteer and the students affect society. Right there. Uh, you'll notice that often if a noun or the subject is plural, the verb will not have an S on, that, on it. So keep that in mind as you're going through these as well. Okay, so now we have a diction question. I know this because there are different words that are fairly similar, but we need to see which one fits best in the piece. Um, one recent study by Sarah E. Helms, assistant professor of economics at Stanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, did focus specifically on mandatory volunteering. Okay, so that's kind of what we talked about with compulsor, compulsive, compulsivity. Um, so the volunteering is mandated by the school. That is a possibility. Uh, coercive is a little harsh. They're not coercing children into doing it. Um, and then forcible just does not fit um, with how that sentence is structured. And then imperative would, would mean that it is, it's imperative that you do something. So it's necessary in a bigger picture as opposed to we are telling you that you have to do this. It is a mandatory thing. So that will just stay as A. Uh, if you look at this one, it is the same verbiage with different punctuation in the middle. So we have, she found that students were who were required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours in early high school. Uh, they then did significantly less regular volunteer work. Okay, so this is complete found that students who were required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours. So that's complete. And then this is complete as well. So we have to get rid of the comma. And then we have uh, they then, comma, we don't need that part. They, comma, then, so that doesn't work either. This does. So even though this is a semicolon and we've talked about the fact that these are very rarely used correctly, this is one of the rare instances. This comma makes this one wrong. This comma makes this one wrong. The comma between two complete sentences makes A wrong, and so D is the only one that works. Number 20. This is going to be um, a comparison type of question. Um, she found that the students who were required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours early. They then did significantly less hour, less regular volunteer work in 12th grade than, okay, so we're comparing people, the students. They, the students did fewer hours, so this also needs to be, out, be about students. So it's not A because we can't compare students to hours. It could be B because we're comparing students to students. We are not comparing students to hours. Um, so now we have to decide between B and C. So they did significantly less regular volunteer work in the 12th grade than did students who were not required to volunteer or compared with students not required to volunteer. Because it's a comparison, this idea of uh, than and then completing it with who were makes more sense grammatically. So this one is B. Okay, we have two more on this passage. Which, of the, which choice most effectively sets up the points made in the next sentence? So the point in the, in the next sentence says, many studies show that when schools simply tell students about opportunities for community service and connect them with organizations that need help, more students volunteer on their own free will. Okay. So instead of requiring schools to volunteer, schools have to recognize that not all students are equally well-suited. No, because the sentence starts talking about opportunities. 
Should allow students to spend their time participating in athletics and other extracurriculars? No, it's still about volunteering. Should focus on offering arrangements that make volunteering an easy and attractive choice. That is definitely possible. Are advised to recognize the limits of their ability to influence the students? No. So the connection is this ease of volunteering and making opportunities available. The writer wants a conclusion that states the main claim of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? Um, it is imperative that schools do their part to find volunteers for the many worthwhile organizations in the world. No, it's not their job to find them. It's just, our, it's just the job to instill this idea of volunteering. Schools that do this will produce more engaged, enthusiastic volunteers than schools that require volunteer work. That would be a good choice. Studies in the field of psychology and economics, no, we're not introducing new details into the final paragraph. It is important that students choose charitable work that suits their interest and values. While that is true, it is not the basis of this article. So it is B. Okay, so that is the first, those are the first two passages in the written language. And then we'll move on to passage three. Okay, so we'll just cut that out. On to passage three, marsupials lend a hand to science. Marsupials um, are, a curio are a curiosity among biologists because they lack a corpus callosum, the collection of nerve fibers connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. In most other mammals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right, the right hemisphere controls the left, and the corpus callosum allows communication between these hemispheres. Scientists believe that this structure enables, okay, so we know it's not long believing or will long believe, oops, let me get my pen back, um, or will long believing because that often that ing form of the verb is not right. Um, have long believed would work, long believed does not, so C, have long believed that this structure enables complex tasks by sequestering skilled movements to a single hemisphere without sacrificing um, coordination between both sides of the body. This sequestration would also explain handedness, the tendency to consistently prefer one hand over the other in humans. Okay, so this comma here goes all the way back to this comma. So it's explaining handedness in humans, and then everything between that is a parenthetical phrase. So handedness is the tendency to consistently prefer one hand over the other. Um, it is not prefer and favor, because that would be redundant. Um, it is not pref uh, prefer one hand over the other could be chosen. That doesn't work. One hand on a regular basis. It is this idea of over the other. So A works. That parenthetical phrase can stay how it is. Um, we now have a punctuation question. So, however, a recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum. All right, so we don't really need a, a break there. That sentence, that phrase all flows together is a trait other than that than the presence of a corpus callosum. We know that it's not complete right after trait, so we can get rid of the semicolon and the colon for sure. And this comma is unnecessary because that sentence just flows as one phrase. So 25 is A. Okay, so a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum links as handedness and bipedalism, uh, or links as handedness. So it doesn't link as handedness. That is not a correct idiom. Um, correlates with, we do say that. We do not say correlates from, and we don't say links on. So this is an idiom question. Remember, idioms are one of those rules that the rule is just the rule, and we don't really have an explanation for it. Um, but the presence of the corpus callosum, uh, callosum correlates with handedness, and the, the trait is bipedalism, so walking on two legs. All right. Let's scroll up a little bit and look at question number 27. Which choice accurately reflects information in the graph? So we have to read the first part of the sentence and make sure that the information that follows it is true to the graph. Um, let's start up here just to see what, we're, what we are uh, discussing in the, in the paragraph in general. Researchers at St. Petersburg and the University of Tasmania observed marsupials walking on either two legs, bipeds, so it'd be like kangaroos, or four, quadrupeds, like wallabies, and performing tasks such as bringing food to their mouths. The scientists employed a mean handedness index. Okay, so that's this right here. Um, negative scores indicated left forelimb preference. So negative, everything down here, is right. So A is incorrect. Scores of zero or less, so that's still negative, Indicate a left forelimb preference. All right, so they just rephrase what negative means. That one is still incorrect. 
Positive scores indicate a lack of forelimb preference. Well, that's not true because it says positive is left. A lack of preference would be a zero. Positive scores indicate a left forelimb preference. So this one is accurate to the graph. Okay, so 28, we have more punctuation. Um, let's take a look. While eating, the eastern gray kangaroo, red-necked wallaby, and red kangaroo, and brush-tailed batong. Okay, so we never need a comma after here unless it's like setting up a parenthetical, and this one is not. Um, so list, 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 kangaroo, comma, and brush-tailed batong. That one might work. Uh, we don't need to all of a sudden have a semicolon in the middle of our list and we don't need to have a dash in the middle of our list. So B is the correct answer. Which choice most accurately reflects the data in the graph? Okay, so again, we need to look at what this is saying. So all of these marsupials, all bipedal marsupials, that's a parenthetical, preferred using their left forelimb as revealed by, okay, so positive mean handedness less than 0.2. Okay, so 0.2 would be down here, and they're all over that. So we can get rid of A. Positive mean handedness values greater than 6. Okay, so they aren't all greater than, than 0.6. We can get rid of B. Positive mean handedness index values between 4 and 6. Okay, so that looks right. Mean handedness values of 0. No, that would be a non-preference. So 29 is C based on the graph. All right, 20, or I'm sorry, 30. Which choice provides the best transition from the previous paragraph? So the previous paragraph was about handedness and the graph. Um, Quadrupedal, so this is all about bipedal. Quadrupedal marsupials in the study did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. All right, so having four feet, they don't have a preference. It's not about them having four feet. That's just defining quadruped. Like most other mammals, well, we haven't learned about most other mammals. We've only learned about marsupials, specifically bipeds so far. In contrast with their bipedal counterparts, they don't have a preference. So that one could work because it is a difference. While using their forelimbs for eating, no, that doesn't talk about the handedness or the preference. So 30 is C. 31, which choice presents a main claim of the passage? Um, so remember, we don't read the first part because that is just choice A. We can start reading with as. As the researcher noted, the quadrupeds typically live in trees and employ all four limbs in climbing. The bipeds, on the other hand, are far less arboreal, leaving their forelimbs relatively free for tasks um, that involve handedness. Um, okay, so kangaroos, though, still do not exhibit handedness to the extent humans do. Um, that's not necessarily being discussed right here. Um, humans have not been discussed since the beginning of this passage. For the marsupials in the study, then, handedness seems to be associated with bipedalism. Okay, that's true because we learned that quadrupeds do not have a preference. There are many things scientists do not understand about the marsupial brain. That would be a little unfair to discuss right now. Additional studies on this phenomenon will need to be performed with other mammals. No, it's just this idea of bipedalism going hand in hand with handedness. Hand in hand with handedness. Okay. Um, so the bipeds, on the other hand, are far less arboreal, living in trees, leaving their forelimbs relatively free for tasks. Um, so tasks is not a human term, it's an idea, so we can get rid of all the human words. So whom and whose. So task in which is normally what we would say, in which handedness may confer an evolutionary advantage. Um, the writer wants to conclude the passage by recalling a topic from the first paragraph that requires additional research. Okay, so um, why the majority of marsupials studied preferred their left forelimbs while the majority of humans prefer their right remains a mystery, however, as does the mechanism by which, in the absence of a corpus callosum, the hemispheres of the marsupial brain communicate. Okay, so that was discussed in the beginning, so let's hold on to that one. The research should not neglect the sizable minority of humans who are left-handed. We didn't really talk about that in the beginning of the passage, and this wants to, um, this wants to recall a topic from the first paragraph. Uh, scientists believe that the studies like this one may someday yield insights into the causes of neuro neurological disorders. We have not discussed neurological disorders. And an additional study pl is planned to study handedness in other animals that stand upright only some of the time. No. So the only one that gives nod back to that first paragraph is this idea of the corpus callosum. All right, one more passage. 
as employee benefits, or I'm sorry, an employee benefit that benefits employers. Um, the first question is which choice provides the most effective transition from the previous sentence to the information that follows immediately? So we are going to read everything up to here, and then we're going to skip this and read here and decide in our head what the relationship between those two sentences is. Um, so according to a 2014 report from the Society for Human Resource Management, 54% of surveyed companies provided tuition assistance to employees pursuing an undergraduate degree, and 50% do so for employees uh, working towards a graduate degree. Okay, so we learned about all these percentages that are um, going towards education. More companies should consider helping employees pay for education because doing so helps do something. That's another question. Okay, so 54% and 50% do this already. And then the second sentence is asserting that more companies should do this. So I wouldn't say despite these findings because then that seems like we would be changing in a, in a negative way to a different conversation. Um, oh, sorry, this guy. Uh, in addition to the 2014 report, more companies should? No, because that would not be an addition to. In addition to would require more information from a separate report. Although these levels are impressive, more people should pay? That would work. Whether they want to or not? No, that seems a little forcible. So C does everything we need it to do. Although these levels are impressive, more companies should do this. Why should we? they do it? We need to establish the main idea of the passage, so we might have to come back to this one because it's a little bit big of a question. Um, okay, so 36, we have another um, plural versus possessive question. Tuition reimbursement programs signal that employees offer their workers opportunities. Okay, so workers is not possessive. Opportunities for personal and professional development. Okay, and then opportunities is also not possessive. So C is the correct answer for 36. 37. Um, according to Professor of Management Peter Capelli, such opportunities are appealing to highly motivated and disciplined, disciplined individuals, may attract applicants with these desirable qualities, may and businesses concur, explaining his company's decision to expand its tuition assistance program. John Fox, uh, Director of Dealer Training at Fiat Chrysler Automobiles in the United States. Um, okay, so that is a descriptor discussing him. So we need to see what this um, verb connects to. So John Fox blank the importance of drawing. And then the sentence ends here. So this just needs to be a proper verb. So John Fox stressed. It's not stressing because remember, avoid these INGs. Uh, it would not be John Fox and he stressed. It's just John Fox stressed. Okay, and then the Complete sentence ends here, and then we're going to see how he stressed it. This is a benefit that can surely bring up many talents, um, top talent to our dealers, he said. Which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlined portion? Paying for tuition uh, also helps businesses retain employees. Retaining employees is, is important. Okay, so that's repetitive. And the retention, that says the same thing. The retaining of whom? Okay. So now we have employees, uh, retaining of employees, which is important versus uh, helps businesses retain employees and then a semicolon. That is. So this is still basically two separate sentences. This would be the most effective way to combine them into one sentence because then you have a complete to an incomplete clause. All right. Again, we have punctuation. Look, we have degrees, period, because, and degrees, semicolon, because. So we can get rid of both of those. Employees whose tuition is reimbursed often stay with their employer even after they complete their degree because their new qualifications give them. Um, okay, so we don't need this colon. It would just be C. Um, employees whose tuition is reimbursed often stay with their employer even after their, they complete their degree. Even though that is a complete sentence, Separating the colon here uh, between because would not be how a colon works. So this because is, is just part of this phrase. Okay, number 40. The career of Valerie Lincoln, an employee at the aerospace company United uh, Technologies Corporation, UTC, 
is, is a significant success story for her company's tuition reimbursement program. Um, so Valerie Lincoln is an employee at the Aerospace Company United Technologies Corporation. There is this parenthetical dis, uh, defining what UTC is, but we also need to identify that the parenthetical describing Valerie Lincoln ends here. So the career of Valerie Lincoln is a significant success because it starts with a comma, it needs to also end with a comma. So D is the answer choice that accomplishes that goal. Remember, we're not mixing our commas and our dashes, and um, the colon would assert that the sentence, the complete thought ends here, and it does not. It ends with success story with her company. Okay, number 41. Okay. This allowed UTC to retain an employee with a deep knowledge of her industry and years of valuable experience. So this is another diction question. How would you describe knowledge that's impressive? Um, it's not hidden because they know she's a good worker and knows what she's doing. Um, you don't describe knowledge as large because it's not a physical size. And same thing with spacious. That's a physical, a physical measurement. So it is just a deep. Um, I know that also seems physical, but we, we consider depth of knowledge to be a colloquialism. Just a few more. Okay, number 42. If you look at this one, you can already see some patterns. Minimizing and keeping down are very similar, and it's repeated here. Um, being affected of keeping down, so probably it's just D. Let's take a look. Tuition reimbursement can be expensive, and many companies would find it impractical, impractical to pay for multiple degrees for all employees. employees. Businesses have succeeded in keeping down cost and ensuring the relevance of employees' coursework by offering fixed amounts of reimbursement each year. So yes, the answer is D. Number 43. Even with these methods, tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases, especially if classes are likely to divert employees' time. Okay, so the classes are acting as a diversion, so they are likely to divert. That feels correct. Um, likely diverted, that doesn't work, likely in diverting, likely diversions for, while that's not grammatically incorrect, it's also not the correct use of, um, of to divert. Likely to uh, would work better for employees' time. Okay, and then we have one more. The writer wants to insert the following sentence um, about the passage in general. So still, since securing an excellent workforce is crucial to business success, Employees should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs. All right, so this word still is going to be a key, and we need to find out where this goes. So paragraph one, we can start from the top. Um, at the end of paragraph one, we are talking about increasing customer satisfaction, improving the quality of companies. So this is all good things about adding to or continuing to contribute towards employee um, tuition reimbursement. So it wouldn't be there. We wouldn't add a, a, a still, a caveat. Paragraph two, tuition reimbursement programs signal that employees offer their worker opportunities. Um, so this, again, is all good things and people um, providing tuition assistance and tuition reimbursement. So you wouldn't have that caveat there either. Three, uh, paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees. So these are also all good things about tuition reimbursement, and so it wouldn't go after three. But four ends with, even with these methods, tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases, especially if classes are likely to divert employees' time and energy from their jobs. So this is the only time that it introduces a problem. And the sentence that we're looking at says, still, it is a beneficial thing to do. So that is how we know that it goes after paragraph four, because paragraph four is the only time that we would have to reaffirm that this is a good thing. All right, so that is the written language portion for 2018, October.